Good evening, everyone. I'm Professor uh, Rob Saint. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research here at uh, Flinders University, and I'm your host for the evening. It's lovely to see so many people here in what promises to be a very interesting, uh, I would say, exciting night. But first, I'd like to acknowledge that we meet on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and pay uh, respects to elders past and present. I recognise and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs and relationships with the land, which are of continuing importance to the Ghana people today. Before we commence this evening, please note that the emergency exits are located outside of these doors, down the stairwell, down to the plaza area out the, uh, out the front, and that's where you should assemble if, um, uh, if, if yet another emergency befalling this country uh, arises. Hopefully not. Um, oh, on the facilities, the, the um, toilets are located just to the right down the little alleyway down there. So welcome and thank you for joining Flinders for this research lecture series entitled Brave. If you wish to share this event with your peers, please make sure to hashtag Brave Research into your posts or tweets. Brave is not just a reflection uh, of the extraordinary research that Flinders University pursues today. It's a call to action that harks back to, to the earliest days of our institution. Our founding Vice-Chancellor, Professor Peter Carmel, explained his ambitions for, for Flinders in the now famous quote, we want to experiment and experiment bravely. It's a concept that's captured the imagination of successive generations of Flinders researchers and continues to inspire us today. This bravery is evident in our researchers and the new research discoveries that we're sharing with the world as we pursue our mission to change lives and change the world and make a difference by better understanding our world, by addressing big challenges, and by changing lives for the better through our research. We're in for a real treat tonight uh, as we hear about and discuss research that's changing our view of how we came to be as we are. Professor John Long will discuss his thesis that the big steps in human evolution took place well before fishes left the water to invade land. This research provides a new perspective on our evolutionary story, a story which comes from looking up from the water's edge, not looking down from the trees. For the past two centuries, the key evolutionary narrative has been about how humans evolved from apes. While this is part of our history, well, this part of our history is well documented from, the, from many fossil remains, it's only, part, it's only the end part of a much grander story. The beginnings of the human body plan, along with many of our intrinsic behaviours, first appear much deeper in time. Professor John Long is an Australian paleontologist who is currently strategic professor in paleontology here at Flinders University. He has had an illustrious career in paleontology, working at a number of major museums, most recently before coming to Flinders as the Vice President of Research and Collections at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. He's also an author of popular science books. I think mainly for children, is that right, John? Uh, no, no, adults and children. Adults and children. I've got to read yeah. the... Uh, I've only <laughs> looked at the children's ones. Um, <laughs> his main area of research is on the fossil fish of the late Devonian Gogo Formation, which is located in northern Western Australia. This formation has yielded many important insights into fish evolution, such as Gogonesis and Mastopisis. I have no idea where I've pronounced those correctly. Yeah. The latest specimen being crucial to our understanding of the origins of vertebrate reproduction. John's love of fossil collection began at age seven and he graduated with a PhD from Monash University in 1984, specialising in Paleozoic fish evolution. Please joining, join me in welcoming Professor John Long. Thanks, Rob. Thank you very much, Rob. Um, some of you that have heard me speak before will know some of this story because you will have seen some of my discoveries of the past. But tonight I'm going to try and frame it in a completely new way um, and look at the big questions that override not just, you know, what does a fossil tell us, but what does it actually tell us about uh, evolution in terms of the overall narrative that's continually changing. Uh, come on. Oh, this one. Sorry. It's meant to change, isn't it? Um, how did you change the thingy? Uh, this is not. It's not changing. Oh, oh right. It's a flicker. Is that how it works? 
can leave that pad off. Um, All right. Oh, there we go. That's me. <laughs> so evolution. We all know Charles Darwin, you know, the founder of the, the main theory of organic evolution. Um, but the tree of life was always there. People thought about life in terms of trees well before Darwin. Evolution just fills in the gaps. And that, that's a quote by Simon Conway Morris, a good colleague of mine who works on Cambrian fossils from the Burgess Shale. And then when we look at the traditional, I suppose, memes about evolution, we get this, this picture of humans evolving from apes, which was the most controversial part of Darwin's work. It wasn't so much from Origin of the Species, but from the ascent of man, which came a few years later. But the tree below sort of is symbolic that evolution connects us all with all living things. So we all share DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid, and we share certain patterns in that DNA with every living thing, including bananas and bacteria. So it's an irrevertible uh, fact that, you know, parts of the DNA of a banana is shared with a human as it is shared with bacteria. So, you know, we're all built from the same building blocks, if you like. And I'm going to talk a bit, little bit more about that later. But evolution has a lot of contemporary value. Um, a bunch of colleagues and I recently put out a book called Pragmatic Evolution, where we looked at the applications of evolutionary theory. And there's chapters in this book about evolutionary medicine, which is a very important thing right, to, right now with coronavirus. The way flu viruses mutate every year, that's evolution. That's happening. It affects every single one of us in this room. Evolutionary agriculture. You know, what is the original gene stock of those plants that eventually became cultivated to become the wheat we eat today or the fruit and vegetables that we grow? They're probably nothing like the original species in the wild. So they have evolved. And evolution is happening whether it's by uh, natural sources and selection or by human guidance. It's still a process of evolution. Same with ecology. Um, there's a whole new sc school of fisheries management based on evolutionary principles. Um, evolutionary philosophy, I think, is one of the most important of the lot. Our place in nature as human beings. Where are we going? Where have we come from as a species? You know, these are big questions. They're very important questions. Um, Daniel Dennett's uh, philosopher in America said it was the most dangerous question to ask about the place of nature and evolution uh, in terms of the way we reflect on, you know, exactly where we've come from and our relationship to theology and, and other, other sort of ideas about um, the world. And finally, there's areas of evolutionary mathematics and computing that are very important today, looking at um, genetic algorithms, evolving networks and collective intelligence and artificial intelligence. Some uh, computer programmers in America can run programs and let them run for years and years and years and see how they naturally evolve without humans actually touching them. And they evolve their own uh, patterns exactly like organic evolution of, of organisms. So this begs the big question. And this is the question I'm going to, you know, the overarching question for tonight is why did we evolve the way we are today? I mean, why didn't we evolve like any of these creatures? There's a wonderful piece of artwork there by Patricia Piginini in the bottom left-hand corner. Of uh, She often tests the boundaries of what humans and animals could look like uh, under different evolutionary sort of scenarios. But we did evolve to, to look at a specific shape, a, a, a certain pattern. We don't have two heads. We don't have four arms. But why are we like this and not anything else? And that, that's a very interesting question. I was very privileged a couple of nights ago to meet Stellark, a performance artist, at a wonderful new exhibition that's on at the Flinders Art Gallery. And I urge you all to go and see it. It's free and it's running for the next couple of months. And artists like this actually question our boundaries, defining you know, the interface between evolution and technology. He has an artificial arm on his ear. So why didn't we evolve arms on our ears in the first place? Is a great or ears on our arms, I should say, in the first place? <laughs> it's, it's a really good question. Because evolution is constrained by laws, laws and rules, like all of us. And if you break those laws and rules, you don't get arrested, you just go extinct. So all land animals, we tetrapods, we have four arms and legs. Except if we lose them. So snakes, uh, tetrapods, that primitive fossil snakes had arms and legs, and then eventually lost those arms and legs. 
whales, early whales had four legs. They walked on land and then began to swim in water. And eventually they've still got the four le forearms, which are the pectoral fins or the flippers, but they've lost the, the hind limbs. And I love this picture of this strange looking cat. Uh, but you know, that, that, that head, you know, all animals have one head, but you do get vertebrates that have two heads, genetic mutants, and it's quite common in reptiles, sometimes mammals. So what causes these patterns to evolve and, and become constrained by, by certain factors? And it really comes down to the genetic blueprints we all share with other organisms. And these are called homeobox or hox genes. They're blueprints for building bodies in a certain set way. So between an insect and a human, there are the same patterns of hox genes that control the same sorts of development, like the limbs, the limbs or arms or legs of a vertebrate, uh, developed by Sonic Hedgehog the same way those limbs in an insect are developed. It's basically like this particular gene turns on a process that develops a limb and then it turns it off. So through this uh, recent breakthroughs in um, evolutionary developmental biology, we can see now by marking genes that express the same kind of origins of tissues in organisms. So the picture on the right shows the hand of a mouse and the fin of a fish showing the common molecular markers made from the same embryonic tissue that develops into those structures. This is a wonderful tool now for evolutionary biology because you can actually mark certain tissues in an embryo and see where they, where they end or you can um, tinker with those particular genes and turn them on and turn them off and see what structures develop. So how do we relate that to paleontology? Well, New fossil discoveries can rewrite evolution. And I don't mean that in a, in a metaphorical way. I mean it in a literal way. Basically, we're changing the textbooks. And we've done this recently. So we can redefine the boundaries of the existing rules of evolution. Sometimes we redefine the timing or the origins of anatomical structures. We can change our perceptions in what are the big milestones in evolution. How do we do this? The answer is by revealing new, unexpected skeletal patterns of development. Sometimes we find a fossil and it's so bizarre or weird that it doesn't fit the expected norm, you know, what we should find in, say, the fin of a fish or the skull of a particular animal. So this is an expected pattern, right? It's a, it's a horse skeleton. This is what I call an unexpected pattern. If you found that, you'd think, well, that doesn't quite fit the laws of evolution, does it? And it's true, we would never evolve a human skeleton on a horse skeleton because that is breaking many of the rules of evolution. But you get the idea of what I'm talking about. And so we look at fossils because fossils are the evidence of life in the past. The museums of the world, I added this up once, collectively they hold over a billion fossils. And that's easy to get to that number. I used to work in Museum Victoria as the head of science. We had over five million fossils in the collection there. The Los Angeles County Museum probably had five or six million. Um, and basically, when you drill down into the big museums of the world, like the Smithsonian and the Natural History Museum of London, they can have tens of millions of, of specimens in their collections. So we have a huge collection of evidence that was virtually entirely missing in Darwin's day. So, so most of Darwin's uh, work on evolution, how he derived his theories, was from observation of living organisms and the variation of, um, amongst their species, with a little bit of fossil evidence as icing on the top. But since Darwin's day, we've now got this vast collection of fossils of all ages and fossils of exceptional preservation. And this is what I'm going to talk about a bit tonight, because it's fine to have a smudge on a rock that you think could be a shell or it could be a bug or something, and many fossils are like that, including skeletons. They're crushed or squashed and, you know, they're hard to interpret. But when you've got perfect three-dimensional fossils that are exceptional quality, then it's really easy to see um, beautiful preservation and, and find a lot of features or observations on those fossils that you wouldn't normally see. And that's where sometimes the big ideas have dropped out. So what are our tools and skills as paleontologists? Well, we basically only have two, and the two skills are uh, to go out and find fossils, um, and our other skill is to analyze them and interpret them and what, you know, find out what they mean. And to do that, we go out in the field. We find new evidence through exploration. 
Um, this is called a brave lecture and um, some of these exp expeditions we go on do require a fair amount of courage, dare I say. Um, I've had four expeditions to Antarctica and I've had some very close shaves with crevasses and avalanches, but I love going to these places to work because we find exciting fossils. And the work has taken me to many, many wonderful places and I'm very lucky to have had these experiences to, to collect in such amazing places. But it's also the, the new technology we have now. You know, in the old days you'd find a fossil, you'd dust it off, you'd put it under a microscope, you'd draw it, you'd take photographs and you'd describe it. You know, this is a new species of shell or something like that. But now we can put them through synchrotrons, through neutron beams in, at Ainstow, uh, micro CT and all sorts of different kinds of analytical tools and get the layers that have previously been missed. We get the internal structure of those fossils right down to the cellular level. And sometimes we can even tell the origin of the tissues um, through the cells that are, that are trapped in the matrix of those bones and so on. So we're getting whole levels of new information from macroevolutionary levels of you know, patterns of skeletons to microevolutionary levels of how tissues and cells have, have evolved. Just a few... Um, Happy snaps of, of some of my recent expeditions. Um, the last uh, trip to Antarctica over 2018-19, I went down with a group from Chicago, um, Port Neil Shubin's team, University of Chicago, funded by the um, National Science Foundation of the US and, the, and their Antarctic program. So we're able to go to the Transantarctic Mountains, which was a remote place away from the base. Uh, they landed us in on a twin otter aircraft. We had skidoos and sledges to, to pull our gear and we're basically camping in these mountains to, to search for fossils of Devonian age. They are fishes about 380 million years old. And uh, a lot of this work is finding the fossils. You don't just land and make a camp and say, oh, I think I'll walk over to this mountain and start digging up fossils. A lot of it is actually finding the fossil sites and having an eye to recognise layers that have bone um, you know, sticking out of them. And then when we find these layers, we're able to sit down with hammers and chisels and, and work those layers. And it's really old stone tool masonry kind of work. We don't have power tools up on these mountains because you can't carry a generator up to the top of a mountain in Antarctica. And at the end of the day, you have to carry everything up and everything down the mountain on your back. And so we sit there with hammers and chisels and split rocks until we find interesting fossils. And the good thing about Antarctica is you've got 24 hours of daylight. You don't have to worry about night. You know, if you're on a good thing and you're finding fossils, you can keep going because it never gets dark over summer. So the second aspect of our, of our skill set here is the kind of high, highly sophisticated tools we use. Um, we have a wonderful Australian synchrotron in Melbourne, and there's a picture of Alice Clement, who works in our lab, uh, setting up a sample. Uh, sometimes we use the European synchrotron, which is also very well set up for uh, just analysing fossils. This shoots high-powered beams of electrons through fossils so we can image them, um, you know, slabs of rock that are very thick that normally won't get uh, imaged through micro-CT. But even better is the neutron beam facility at Ansto in Lucas Heights in New South Wales where beams of neutrons will go through much thicker bodies of rock and image the, the fossil content inside those rocks with great clarity, fantastic crystal clarity. And that's only really been um, online for the last year and a half or two years or so, we've been able to use that a wonderful new piece of equipment. But why is paleontology still important today in this modern day and age of high technology? Well, despite the fact uh, we have wonderful information from biological specimens that are alive, we still have gaps that, that show the stages going from one stage of organism to another are missing and the only evidence of those missing stages are through fossils. So for example, if we're looking at fish today, we go from something without jaws like a lamprey to something with jaws like a shark and we think, oh well, that's a lot of, lot of different stages have been missing in that, in that big evolutionary step. And then this figure shows there's at least probably another seven or eight major stages of evolutionary development that are only known through extinct creatures. Without studying those extinct creatures, we have no idea of how you get from a lamprey to a shark. What are the, the timing of those stages? What are the development? And what is, what's the significance of each of those steps? 
So the tree of life is indeed complicated. There's lots of organisms in there. Plants, animals, everything living is on the tree of life and we're all connected by different branches. And we are the vertebrates, we are the backboned animals, we have skeleton. And somewhere back in time, the very first backboned animal arose. Um, I'm gonna start with a creature from the Burgess Shale in Canada called Metasprigina. And it uh, appeared about 510 million years ago, something like that. And so that's our journey from that fish to us humans today. And there's the origin of that fish, Metasprigina, in the middle of the tree. And then we go up to jawed fishes and uh, bony fishes. And eventually we get amphibians with arms and legs and reptiles. And then reptiles split off into one group that are mammal-like reptiles and another group that form the dinosaurs and crocodiles. And eventually they go up and form birds up there. But if we go back to our mammal-like reptiles, they eventually form the first mammals and primates and eventually lead to us. And so that's our journey on the tree of life, if you like. So let's look at human evolution from backwards for a bit before we go upwards. So if we look back just four million years, you know, this is a pretty recent um, family tree of human species. And you can see that, you know, I mean, and it's very simplified, of course, but we have the oldest member of our lineage, Australopithecus animensis, is about four million years ago, right? And then a fairly recent uh, member, but not the most recent, obviously, is Homo erectus, which, you know, disappeared about half a million or more less, actually, 30,000, 30, 40,000 years. No, no, it's probably about 400,000, something like that. But the main point is to go from that level of development to the next level, which is practically a, a human that you can resemble, especially in the, the skull, the, the reconstructions are very fanciful. Um, you see there's a time interval there of about three and a half million years. Not much change. I would say the only change going from those two levels is proportional change. There's no new structures added, no new evolutionary features added. There's more things taken away than added. In fact, modern humans have lost a lot of their junk DNA compared to apes. And one of the big evolutionary developments in recent years is not that DNA gets more complex or the genomes get bigger, but they get simpler. They get stripped away of the junk that we don't need. If we go back 40 million years, then what would a human ancestor look like? So that's this point. Well, that's at the branch between the, the apes and the different families of monkeys. And basically something like a common marmoset would be the closest thing to our lineage. If we go back 200 to 300 million years, we get to the very first mammals on the planet. So we've got simple furry animals as the most closely related thing to us today. If we go back 300 million years, we get reptiles that are approaching the grade of mammals. In other words, they are reptiles in all their skeletal features, but they have the beginnings of some of those structures resembling mammals, particularly in the jaws. 400 million years ago, we're a fish. We have no other way of looking at our ancestry but looking at fish that are the closest to land animals or tetrapods. And it's this fish, and I was one of the authors that described this fish from China, which we called Tungsenia. And it's the oldest direct fish on our lineage 400 million years ago. We don't know much about it, but from CT scanning, we've got a good idea of the brain and some of the uh, structures of the, the brain case and, and the glands and things like that. So this brings me to the point of all this, that we can look at evolution from two main perspectives. One is innovation, how do new structures evolve, like arms, legs, jaws, skulls. And these are things like, take the origin of jaws. That was a really big step in evolution. Before jaws appeared, we couldn't have teeth. So lampreys and things like that were parasitic fishes that didn't have any jaws. And then eventually the very first jaws probably formed from the first gill arches in these jawless fish. And then with dermal denticles invading the mouth, um, you've got the beginnings of teeth, if you like. And you've got something with jaws and teeth that can then become a predator. That's really important. So I call that, that's an innovation. It's a new structure that's evolved. Changes in proportion of existing structures I call modifications. So this is what the jaw of the very first jawed fish looked like. A very simple jaw with very primitive teeth, as you can see. And then you get a jaw of an early amphibian. Um, not much different, actually, from an early reptile jaw, but, you know, 
it's just longer and there's more teeth and so on. And then eventually, there's a lot of changes going to a human or a hominid jaw. We lose the number of bones in that lower jaw, and the bone at the front that's got the teeth called the dentary becomes the dominant bone. Nonetheless, these are modifications of existing structures. There's nothing added, there's only things lost in that stage of evolution. That's another important thing. Things that get lost through evolution, not gained. So, ranking these things, you know, well, ranking only means that, you know, you see these things in different ways of, in different degrees of significance, if you like. Adding a whole new structure is a big step. But taking a structure and modifying it slightly is not such a big step. So jawless fish, some of the ancient jawless fish, uh, they have no teeth or jaws, they don't even have paired fins. Uh, but they do share things with humans, they have bone. You know, they're the very first creatures on earth to have a bony skeleton, even though they're bony plates on the outside of the fish. And they also have the beginnings of sensory organs arranged in a package in the head that we would recognise, like a pair of eyes, a mouth, but some of them have paired nostrils, others have one nostril on top of the head. But by the time we get to the early jawed fish, like this ancient fish called a placoderm, we get a number of traits that we also see in humans. For example, those paired fins at the front, pectoral fins are the same as your arms, paired fins at the back, pelvic fins are the same as your legs. They have plates of bone on the skull that you can recognise as the equivalent to some of the paired bones on the top of your skull. They have the same bones that form the jaw, they have the same bones uh, in the girdles that form the shoulder girdles and so on. So you've got the beginnings of those innovations there, even though they're in a very different form from the human equivalent, if you like. But it's when we get to these bony fish, the osteichthians, the things like the coelacanth, that we get very advanced patterns of their skeleton that are forming, that start to form in the human. So the same kinds of bones in the head and cheek and palate and even in the arms and so on. So how do we rewrite evolution through finding new discoveries that change existing dogma? I'm going to just talk about three things briefly tonight so we won't get bogged down. My favourite of course is the origins of complex sexual reproduction using copulation and strangely enough this is linked to the origin of limbs. We're also going to look at the origin of air breathing and how this is, strangely enough, linked to the origins of hearing. And then we're going to look at the origin of our tetrapod arm and leg pattern and the origin of digits, or fingers and toes, in animals. And some of this is very recent new research. It's not even published. It's about to be published in the next week or two in the journal Nature. And so that is why this talk is not going to go online until that paper gets published in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> None of you are allowed to take any photos either of these slides. I'll, yeah, I'll be, watch, I'll be watching. <laughs> so let's talk about the origins of complex reproduction. So we all know that fish, you know, spawn in water. That's the common primitive way fish breed. You know, the females lay a whole lot of eggs on the bottom, and the males excrete sperm all over them, and basically those little eggs then are fertilised. But some fish reproduce using copulation. Uh, in other words, intermittent organs, where the male will place sperm inside the female. Uh, sharks and rays do this, but they do it in a very primitive way. Uh, they have these large structures off the pelvic fins called claspers that they use to deposit packages of sperm inside the female. So the prediction from living animals would be that um, because the sharks are more primitive than the trout, that primitive fossil-jawed fishes... Um, you know, the, no, sorry, the clasping organs are more complex structurally than animals that don't have them. So trout and goldfish and things like that don't have external genitalia. They just don't need them. So there's a big question here is what was the primitive condition like? Did they just spawn in water like trout? Because that's the primitive easy way to do it. Why get messy and complex if you can do it in simple ways? Evolution's first law. So I'm going to take you now to a fossil site that um, has been the love of my life. I first went up there in 1986 to Gogo uh, near Fitzroy Crossing. And it's a wonderful site where you get all these wonderful limestone nodules littering the paddocks because they've eroded away from millions of years being in a soft shale. And when you split these nodules with a hammer, 
if you're very, very lucky, about one in a thousand, that's what I estimate, contains a really good fossil. And here are the bones of a skeleton of a fish. And the thing about Gogo -Go that's special is that while most fish of this age that are 380 million years old are squashed flat on rock, like the kind of fish you find in the old red sandstone of Scotland, these fish are three-dimensionally perfect. So once you prepare them out using acetic acid, the bones come out in three dimensions and you can glue them together and make a, a 3D perfect fish. Um, one of the discoveries that we made in 2007 by preparing one of these ancient armoured placoderm fishes out, we discovered that inside the skeleton it had a number of tiny little bones, uh, which at first we thought were the stomach contents, the last meal that this fish might have eaten. But when we looked more closely, we resembled, uh, an, it resembled an embryo. In other words, it was the same species as the adult fish, but much, much smaller. But the, clen the clincher was finding a mineralized umbilical cord, which you can see there in, in purple arrow. Um, and we published this in the journal Nature as being the oldest evidence of live birth. So we pushed back animals reproducing by sexual reproduction, complex copulation, back by about 200 million years in the fossil record. And it made the Guinness Book of World Records, actually, in 2010. I did, we didn't enter it. Somebody just put it in as the oldest live birth on the planet. And there's a picture of me holding up this fish. <laughs> so there's the picture of the embryo of the uh, umbilical cord, amazingly mineralized. And since then, we've got another paper that we haven't submitted yet, uh, led by Kate Trenajczyk, who's my first PhD student, who's now at uh, Curtin University. And Kate has identified a, a number of soft tissues in these fish you wouldn't believe, like livers, hearts, the um, complete alimentary canal, the stomach, um, and we've got muscles in them as well. So we're starting to learn about not just the skeletons of these ancient fish, but their full anatomy. So this one turned out to be a completely new fish, and that's always fun because we get to name it. So I called it Mata Pisces, Attenborough Eye, or Mata meaning mother, the mother fish after David Attenborough. When I met Sir David, when he came to Adelaide, he was really delighted to have this fish named after him. It's a, he said it's a great honour. So, another expedition then to Scotland in 2014 and 2016 with this fine bunch of reprobates there. Um, actually, they're lovely people. Um, they took me to a place in the far north of Scotland, the Orkney Islands, where these Middle Devonian uh, shales are producing amazing, complete articulated fish. And so some of the specimens we found include skeletons of these very primitive jawed fish called antiarchs that have um, tiny little arms on the side of the, of the, of the body. Uh, but these were the first to show reproductive organs or claspers on the males. So they look like little feet, but they've actually got grooves there for passing the packages of sperm. And these are actually bony ossified reproductive organs. And these fish sit at the bottom of the family tree of all vertebrates, the very primitive jawed vertebrates that are even more primitive than the other placoderms we found the, the embryos in. And so it was not only we found them on the males, but we also found, uh, as you see in the illustrations below, the females had distinctive genital structures as well. And we believe that was because these fish mated by interlocking arms so the male could get purchase to place the clasper inside the cloacal region of the female. And that's a, a beautiful piece of art done by Brian Chu, who's another one of our Flinders paleontology group here, who's also a bit of a very talented artist. And so what did it show? Well, the current um, dogma before we made this discovery was that sexual reproduction in vertebrates evolved where the red dot is, the beginning of the sharks and rays, uh, but then was lost in some lineages and then regained again in others. But that was a pretty sort of messy explanation. The story has now been rewritten because we now know that copulation evolved with the earliest jawed fishes and was secondarily lost in major lineages and then regained in others, something biologists could never thought would have happened. So it goes right back to this stage of evolution where we've got all these primitive ancient armoured fishes all having rep complex reproductive structures. But that doesn't end there. There were two unexpected discoveries with this work that we never expected. And this is the joy of paleontology. When you do this research, you find these fossils, you write these papers. Sometimes there's a completely new spin-off that you never expected. And ours was that 
as Kate was looking into the, um, the soft tissues of these fish, we discovered that these placoderms from Gogo had paired abdominal muscles, you know, transverse abdominal muscles. So the only creatures that have them alive today don't include any fish. There's not one living fish today that has paired abdominal muscles. We get them in tetrapods, right? We get them in amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. And if you want to see what they look like in a mammal, you just have to look at the James Bond uh, picture of uh, Daniel Craig emerging from the sea. So that was totally unexpected. It's not a pattern of evolution you'd expect. You know, so it kind of tells us that these muscles must have arisen once early in evolution, then been lost, but laid dormant until a later stage when they arose again in other vertebrates. But the second thing was even more bizarre, that the way these claspers evolved in placoderms, these are bony structures, right? Bony structures with two kinds of bone. They have a dermal bone, which is the same as the bones in the top of your skull. They also have an endochondral, or we call a perichondral bone, or a shell of bone around cartilage. And so the combination of those two structures together, you only get in limbs, in arms and legs, and, and other structures um, that are more complex, like skulls. So basically, we decided that, um, we wrote this up in our paper in 2015, that we had three pairs of limbs in cla placoderms, and that these external genital structures evolved as orthologs, or genetic um, you know, extension of the Hox gene process of making limbs, as one more extension of that. So this is something totally unexpected. It's like the three pairs of limbs in the centaur I showed you at the start. We've actually shown that this, this is actually the primitive condition for all vertebrates was possibly three pairs of limbs, not two pairs of limbs. And this is where developmental biology links the paleontology together. Because when we look at the development of these limbs uh, through different Hox genes, we see in the stingray we have two phases of expression of this gene to develop the claspers, which are the reproductive organs. And if we look at the development of a mouse, we find that, see all these dark colored little buds there, that the limbs develop at the same time as the urogenital plate, which develops the sexual organs from the same expression of sonic hedgehog, the gene that develops limbs. So, you know, we predicted from our fossils that you know, placoderm genitalia were developed the same way as limbs, and now we've got developmental evidence from experiments looking at uh, mice development that this is the same pattern we see in living organisms. I'm now going to switch to the origin of air breathing. And this is a simple one. We all know that fishes live in water, right? So they have gills. They breathe through their gills. Although some highly advanced specialised fishes like lung fishes can gulp air and take air into their lungs by swallowing gulps of air at the water surface. And there's a picture of a lungfish there from Africa, and you can see the way that there's a lung inside the body, and they have a simple pulmonary system to get the oxygen um, out of that lung into their, into, their, into their bloodstream. So we discovered a fish back in 2005. Um, Rob, Rusain, you'll see a picture of Tim Senden there, his second from the right. You just met him recently. So he was the first trip I ever took him on um, to go go with me. And so Tim found this specimen, which was an amazing specimen. You can see just in the field, it just looked like a, a few shiny bits of bone. But then when you put it in acid, you see what emerges this beautiful three dimensional perfect skull. Absolutely amazing. And then that's what it looks like after you put it through the micro CT scanner and you get the inside slices of the anatomy of the head. You know, it's really mouth-watering kind of paleontology stuff. And in our paper in Nature, we're able to show that this fish actually sheds light on the origin of air breathing in, in these uh, tetrapod-like vertebrates. So how does it shed light on air breathing? Well, it has these whopping great holes on top of the head, which we identify as spherical structures, because they are grooves inside that lead to the back of the pharynx or the gullet, which would then go and connect to the lungs. But the gill arches in this fish, which are usually crushed in most fossils, are three-dimensional and perfect. And we see that they've actually been reduced in number compared to the full number you get in a normal fish. So a fish that breathes through its gills might have five or six gill arches. This one's got three. And so living lungfish that breathe air have between two and four gill arches that are functional. So this is direct evidence that these fish were actually breathing air. Further evidence came from some research 
I did with a bunch of modern ichthyologists at La Jolla in California, led by Jeffrey Graham, where we looked at the living African reed fish and we put it in some aquaria behind a blind so that they weren't stressed by people coming in and out of the room. And we found that these fish were taking in 93% of their oxygen through these holes on the top of the head called spiracles in exactly the same place that the Gogonesis spiracles are located. Why would the blind was important? Because if you don't have a blind, the little graph at the top right shows that they revert to gill breathing and stay underwater when they're stressed. But in a relaxed environment where they're not seeing people come in and out of the room, they gently go up to the top, breathe in through their spiracles and go back down again and end up taking more than 90% of their oxygen just, just through that. Another interesting twist to this story is that the spiracle of these fish that would then evolve into land animals or early amphibians becomes the tympanum in early amphibians. You can see the tympanum is this area where um, the frog receives sound waves that goes directly into the inner ear. So in our human here on the right, we see that this spiracular tube that eventually ends in the tympanum in the frog becomes the eustachian tube in a human. So this is the beginnings of our ability to hear goes back to the way these fishes breathe air for the very first time. And if you're interested, I've got a story in the conversation about that that tells you the whole story and how it's connected. Alice, who's here in the audience, was my PhD student uh, back in Melbourne, and she described this beautiful lungfish, also from the Gogo deposits, which showed the very first time we had air at breathing adaptations in marine lungfish, not lungfish living in fresh water. So it showed there's a whole range of fish at the time were beginning to experiment with air breathing. So let's switch now to the final part of the story, the origins of arms and legs. Fish, we all know, have fins. And tetrapods, land animals, they have arms and legs. They have limbs. Do any fish have fingers? Anyone? No. What do they have? They have fins, that's right. So fingers and toes are unique to land animals. That's, everybody knows that. So the prediction is, if we look back at the paleontology, we should find that this modern tetrapod pattern, say the, the three arm bones that we all have in our arm, the humerus ulna radius, had had to evolve somewhere back in fishes. But fingers and toes, definitely not fishes. They evolved in land animals when they started walking on land because that's the purpose of fingers and toes. They grip the land for you. And if we look at the pattern in a whole range of living creatures, from humans to lizards to bats and whales, they all have that same pattern of humerus ulna radius followed by the wrist bones, followed by the digit bones. That's clear. How far back in evolution would this pattern go? Well, our fish we discovered, or what Tim Sendon found on that fateful day in July in 2005, was the very first member of this fish group that are on the lineage to modern humans, the, the tetrapod lineage, that had a complete three-dimensional arm. And so in that, we could see the humerus ulna radius beautifully preserved, as well as some of the wrist elements, the ulnare, the intermedium, and, and so on. But there's no pattern there that indicates there are digits. So, you know, the theory is still holding uh, pretty well. That's actually the humerus on the right there, shown in different degrees, showing uh, different views, showing how perfectly three-dimensional it's well preserved. But some fishes today have walking capabilities. If you've ever seen the spotted handfish, Brachyonychthys, it walks on its pelvic fins and has tiny little pectoral fins. It sort of walks along just like an amphibian. But it doesn't have fingers and toes. It's still got fin rays that form those hand-like structures. We have to go to an amphibian or a reptile to see the first creatures that have proper digits in serial rows like fingers. So that's the consensus view. Although a lot of evolution was taking place especially in the skulls, where the skulls of these fishes were resembling the earliest amphibians very closely, the limbs were nothing like each other. They were totally different. Now, we switch to another site that um, I've been to, but I haven't really done a lot of field work there, but my colleague Richard Cloutier, who came out to Flinders last year as a visiting international research fellow, he spent his whole life working at this amazing site. And as you can see there, we get beautiful three-dimensional skulls of fish like this stem tetrapod called Eusthenopteron and ancient placoderms like the Bothrylepis below. 
And what would a real missing link, or we call them today transitional fossils, between fishes and tetrapods look like? You know, you can see the cartoon there. We're pretty sure it's the missing link. Uh, and it's crawling up towards uh, a sign saying outright deception. So, you know, we have no idea what these things would have looked like. But a fish was discovered, um, described by my colleagues Neil Schubert and Ted Daeschler back in 2006. Tiktaalik from Can Canada, Arctic Canada. And it looked a bit like that. Although it's not complete, a lot of its skeleton is missing, so we only have parts of it that we, we're confident about. But I'm going to introduce the new kid on the block, Elpistostegi Watsonai, and this beautiful artwork by South Australian artist Katrina Kenny uh, will feature soon in our article about to appear in Nature in the next week or two. And this fish was known originally by a fragment of the skull. And when it was found in 1938, it was thought to be an amphibian. And it was only in the 1980s that a, a little bit more of its skull was found, a snout, they realised it was a fish, a very tantalising fish that looked a lot like an amphibian, but they only had a tiny little bit of it. But then Richard and his team in 2010 found the first complete specimen of this fish. And it truly is stunning. It's 1.6 metres in length. It's perfectly preserved from the tip of the snout to the tip of the tail. And although it's compressed and flat, we've been able to put it through a synchrotron, uh, two different synchrotrons, one in Texas, one in Canada, and get an amazing data set to work on the skeletal anatomy of this fish. And we're, that's a reconstruction of it there, what it looked like. Um, it's going to appear as figure one in our paper. There's Richard Cloutier, who was a delight to host here at Flinders. Very hard working guy and a great knowledge of these Devonian fishes. And this is what we found. If you look inside the fin of this fish, uh, by CT scanning, we can, we can segment out each of the bones with great clarity. And Alice did this work, Alice Clement, she did a fantastic job. And you can see there that we have a fish that has that same pattern with the humerus ulnar radius, but then we have a complex of many bones distal to that. And those bones have a virtually one-to-one -one correspondence with the wrist and hands of a typical tetrapod. Although we don't have a lot of digits, we're only confident to say we've got two rows of definite digits and a possible five other rows of, of putative digits, depending on how you make the homology with the, with the metacarpals. So this is really revealing the origin of hands in vertebrates, and that is the title of our paper. It's called Elpistostegi and the Origin of the Vertebrate Hand. And so here we see as the fish developed an increasing number of small bones, it could have a greater degree of flexion to lift itself up on the substrate and actually bear weight, which is the first step towards becoming terrestrial and invading land. We made a video. You're going to love this. Um, this is probably what we think the fish look like. There it is in the background in the Devonian world. Oops, I'll move the thing out. Oh, there we go. And that's Elpistostegi. And you'll see in a minute that if we take this fin and we compare it with your hand, we've got really strong evidence that this is the beginning of fingers in the vertebrate lineage back in the fish before they even left the water. And so, um, yeah, there's a lot of credits there. I'll, I'll spare you that. <coughs> Let's turn to something completely different. Motorcycles. <laughs> I love motorcycles. I have a motor Guzzi at the moment. I absolutely love riding motorcycles. I know they're not dangerous. Get that notion out of your head. I've been riding for 45 years. So why is fish invading land exactly like the Paris-Dakar rally? So this is another way of thinking about evolution. Because we have the same systems in place. That we have a body, we have a girdle, which is the shoulder girdle, which is your suspension in a motorbike. You have your wheels, which are like your limbs and your tyres, which are like your digits, they're in touch with the substrate. They're the only thing that matters because they touch the ground, right? And when we look at bikes that have been adapted for off-road use, the engines are basically the same. What changes is the frames, the suspension, and the tyres, which need to be more robust in order to be um, dealing with that harder substrate. And it's exactly the same story with fish going to tetrapods. We see that the head anatomy is similar, it doesn't change. But what does change is the bits behind the postcranial skeleton, going from the limbs, the fin to the limbs, is radical changes. Same with the frame and suspension of the, of the off-road motorbike. That's another project I'm pursuing, but I won't. I'll, I'll give whole lectures on that later down the track, but not now. 
So what are the next steps that we're doing in this project? Well, we had an expedition in 2017 to a place in eastern Victoria called Genoa River, Copra Canberra National Park, where in the 1970s, my PhD supervisor, I had two supervisors, and one of them was Professor Jim Warren at Monash University, and he discovered, uh, along with Norman Wakefield, these early tetrapod trackways of Devonian age in this national park. And in 1972, this was such a big discovery that it made the cover of nature because it was the oldest record of tetrapods walking on land in the whole world. So that's why we went back there. Um, it's a pretty rugged country. We couldn't drive in. We had to get a helicopter to take our little expedition in. And the bush was so impenetrable that we could only walk up and down the river to get access to the outcrops. Uh, but we did camp by the site of the original trackways. This is Alice again, who's recently visited Melbourne, and she, uh, using our new light uh, INAR scanner, able to do a digital light scan of the entire trackways. We did find other new evidence on our field trip, especially geological data that will feed into this project. Um, and so the interesting thing about these trackways is there's thought to be two different trackway makers, you know, two different kinds of tetrapods at this early uh, stage of their evolution, walking on land. So the new digital technology now allows us to analyse these trackways in three-dimensional morphospace space and do um, you know, mathematical plotting of the gait and the spatial relationships between the hands and the feet, which is really exciting because um, I also did some field work back in 2016 on Valencia Island in County Kerry in Ireland where the oldest definite tetrapod trackways on land, uh, 390 million years old, uh, exist. And at the time there was only one or two short trackways known we discovered another six on that trip, and since then the team has gone back and they've discovered another 25. And so these trackways exist all around the entire island, and they're beautifully, beautifully preserved, and they're definitely uh, 390 million years old because they're dated by a volcanic layer above them that is able to be radio, um, radiometrically dated with great accuracy. And so it's a very exciting project. Um, this is just one of the digital scans of one of those trackways where we have hands and feet in a certain pattern. Um, we also have trackways of giant arthropods, which I can't talk about yet because it's under wraps. Uh, but it's a very exciting project. And we're looking at when did tetrapods first become fully terrestrial and what was this early terrestrial ecosystem like? And it's nothing like what the books are saying it is. It's completely the opposite to what we thought before. And um, I'll be telling you more about that as that project develops. Thank you. And that's our crew. Um, yeah, people, acknowledgements, thanks to Alice, Brian, Ben King, my former PhD student, all the team at Flinders Paleo, great support from the, the whole crew there. And, um, you know, I also want to thank Rob Saint for the Visiting International Fellowship Scheme, supporting Richard Cloutier's visit in 2019. Um, and also we've had a lot of support from various grant, granting bodies and so on. So, yeah, that's it. Thanks. Well, fantastic. Actually, it's not fantastic. It's real. Um, but uh, wonderful, wonderful presentation. Thank you, John. Now, we uh, are going to now turn to a panel discussion where you'll have the opportunity to ask um, any questions you would like. Uh, and so I'd like to invite the, uh, the panellists on stage. We have a legend in Australian science communication, Dr Paul Willis. Welcome, Paul. We have Associate Professor Diego Garcia Polito, and I'm sure I didn't pronounce that in Spanish. Uh, that's it. This is, uh, okay. From the University of Adelaide and the South Australian Museum, and someone we've heard quite a bit about tonight, Dr. Alice Clement, uh, who's a postdoctoral research associate here at Flinders University. And I'm going to uh, take the um, chair's prerogative of asking uh, uh, the first few questions. And the first, is to you, Alice. Right. We've seen uh, the, the significance of the technology that's been applied to get, uh, you know, to get a greater understanding of what's going on here. Where would you say we are on the, on the pathway of employing technology to get as much information out? Are we most of the way there? Or are we at the end of uh, the technological developments? Or are we early on in, in that and we've got much, much more to discover, do you think? 
Sure. Well, I think um, technology is always developing, as we know. I'd say we don't know where we're going to end up and where the technology can take us. But I do think this is an especially exciting time to be doing paleontology or other sorts of research because of the doors being opened up by technology um, to us t uh, today. So we heard John mention various technologies in terms of imaging, and this is adding so much value to old specimens that may have been discovered 100 years ago, but nothing much more could be done with them without damaging them or destroying them. And now we can get so much extra information from this material um, by applying some of the modern techniques that we have. And I do think that there's only going to be more and bigger and better to come. So I think it's an exciting time. And uh, now I, I introduced uh, Paul as a as a, a um, science communicator, but of course he did his PhD in paleontology. So uh, Paul, why is it why is it important to communicate paleontological research to a general audience, and what are the challenges in doing that? Uh, I'd like to answer that question in the form of interpretive dance. Uh, no, <laughs> <laughs> I spare you. I, I'll actually uh, answer it in the form of a little story. I mean, uh, I. Uh, I'm alleged to have mentioned my first word in utero, and that word was dinosaur. I was forever interested in dinosaurs and fossils and prehistory. I found my first fossil when I was six. But then, uh, in 1973, Live and Let Die came out, the, the James Bond movie. And one of the um, merchandising around that was a set of tarot cards. And I became fascinated with those. And the card that fascinated me the most was number nine in the Major Arcana, a card called the Hermit, who was a collector of knowledge. But the inverse of that was that they didn't distribute the knowledge they collected. And that resonated with me as a kid because as a kid fascinated with fossils and paleontology and evolution, I was having arguments with my teachers at school about creationism. Mm. And I thought that what is the point of accumulating vast bodies of knowledge if you're not also distributing that knowledge to the world. And so my career path has trodden these two parallel paths. I've managed to maintain my interests uh, in paleontology, but I've also gone into science communication. And when I was at Catalyst, um, I used to have to fight tooth and nail in order to get paleontology stories up. Because as far as the executive producers were concerned, if it's not soft and squishy and furry, um, and if it's not a dinosaur, then it doesn't make a story. Fossils don't move, so you can't make a story out of them. But I managed to fight, and I got lots of stories up with John, um, uh, Diego, I got stories up uh, about the um, uh, Emu Bay Shale, uh, about the Ediacara fauna, Snowball Earth, uh, Aaron, we are in the audience here somewhere. I've got a story up with him about footprints out in uh, Western Victoria. If we hadn't put those stories out there, most of the world would not know about them. So there is this dual importance. It's in, as important to learn new material, to do the research, to, to push back the boundaries of human knowledge but it's also important that you communicate that information. Otherwise, it's irrelevant. It's useless. So that's, that's my story. Mm. And is, is it easy to do? Sometimes. Sometimes it's very difficult. It all depends on how good the person you're talking to works on camera. Terrific. I think my son, the first word he said when he came out was dinosaur, but that's when he took one look at me. <laughs> <laughs> So the last of my questions, and then I'll turn it over to you. So Diego, uh, actually you, you, you mentioned, Paul, the Ediacaran fauna, uh, which were discovered first and are named after uh, Ediacara in South Australia. South Australia has some really significant uh, um, uh, sites, uh, paleontological sites. Uh, I, I wonder um, whether you think we make enough of those sites? Is it something that we're capitalising on as a community and you know, displaying them, getting people to know about them here? Well, <clears throat> I think we're getting there. We're far from it, unfortunately. Uh, South Australia, and that's the reason I, I'm originally from Spain, and I've come to South Australia in particular to look at your early animal fossil record because it's the best in the world. 
both the Ediacaran fossils from the Flinders Ranges just before the appearance of animals and Emu Bay Shell in Kangaroo Island just after the appearance of animals. Uh, I worked uh, originally in the Burgess Shale that uh, John has mentioned a number of times, dug up there for three summers. Uh, and then I realized that, wait a minute, Australia, besides being, you know, paradise has also got some of the best fossils in the planet for what I'm interested in which is early animal evolution so uh, I came here and to my surprise uh, every almost every time I give a presentation to scouts I was one I gave one the other day to uh, Phil uh, uh, young field uh, um, scientist they don't know about this we have to tell our primary and secondary students that part of the best record of early complex life in our planet is right here under our feet. It is their own heritage, and I think we got a lot of work to do. We're, we, we're going all right. Uh, up in the Flinders Ranges, Neil Pina Station has just been purchased by Department of Environment and Water. It's going to be, it's going to be fused with the original Ediacara fossil site discovered by uh, a Red Sprig, and it's going to be, be open to the public. We're going to create uh, not only the beds that we've been exposing for the last 15 years, my colleagues from University of California, Riverside, and, and, and uh, the South Australian Museum, but some new beds that have come up, and so anybody that goes up to the Flinders will have an opportunity to touch those 555 million year old microscopic organisms. They're so strange, so alien, they don't look anything like what came after with the animals. So uh, it's definitely something that it, it is being worked on. It'll, we're getting there slowly but surely. And uh, the Emu Bay Shell, some of these sites, unfortunately, are in private land. And if the landowners are not particularly conducive of having visitors coming to their land, we cannot impose and should not impose the importance of these fossils. We can get some of those and put them into displays. But uh, their land is their land. Uh, up in the Nilpena, that has been purchased, and that is now, as we stand, every South Australian's uh, heritage. It is there for all of us to visit. Thank you. So this is the opportunity, to, I'm going to turn the questions over to you. Uh, I'd just ask that uh, we're recording the session tonight, so please wait for the microphone to come so that uh, everyone and everyone who looks at it later on uh, can hear the question. So over to you. We've got a question down here. Who's got the microphone? We've got another question there. Let's start with these two. Hi, I'm Ian Dispain, a graduate from Flinders. First question, where do you get your shirt? I love it. <laughs> Tell me later. <laughs> um, um, yeah. That came from Fraser's in Glasgow. Oh, damn it's it. Good, Scotland. <laughs> That's too far to go. I have to go back there. Um, second question, the arthropods. I'm, they're amazing creatures. They're part of our evolution. Without giving too much away, what can you tell us about what you touched upon earlier in the lecture? Well, that's really Diego's area to talk about arthropod evolution. Okay. So I'd rather hand over to him. Okay, Diego, one. what can you tell us more about the arthropods and... Okay, the arthropods, it's not only today the most common and diverse group of animals in our planet, but it was like that from the beginning of animal evolution 550 million years ago, uh, 540 million years ago when the Cayman explosion started. Uh, they are very successful because of those appendages. Those appendages are Swiss army knives. They can adapt to anything. And they've got their armor in the outside. And because they can shed that armor, uh, they're quite common in the fossil record because they get rid of that skeleton and then hunt a new one. So one single animal can leave behind hundreds of, or tens, uh, 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 dozens of fossils behind. Whereas f any of us die and get buried, we'd be lucky to find a femur or a few bones. With arthropods, every trilobite actually goes through 20, 30 molts in its lifetime. That's where they're so common in the fossil record. And they're so successful, they've adapted to all the niches. They are from the bottom of the oceans, up flying as well, digging, uh, they, they can, uh, uh, um, they're really good predators, but they're really good at scavengers as well, especially through some of their uh, uh, life cycle uh, elements like larvae and maggots and so on. So they're very, very successful. I am really keen to hear about uh, some of these really early trackways of arthropods. I was talking to one of my colleagues the other day about this, Greg Edgecombe from the Natural History Museum, and he just gave a talk on something like this up in UNE, and I asked him if he could flick the uh, pr uh, presentation over. He hasn't sent that to me yet, but there's new discoveries happening uh, in parallel with vertebrate evolution, we've got invertebrate evolution, and that is giving us additional glimpses as those very new and probably, as, as John was saying, slightly different than what we thought. The environments are not as we had uh, preconceived or we had an idea from 
localities that were well known. What happens with science, science ever grows and changes and adapts and we learn new things and we have to keep tweaking our knowledge because we're finding new stuff and that's what uh, John's uh, talk has been about. And I think the same is happening with those trackways. We're finding ya older and older trackways. The, the maker of those, that I don't know. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading uh, okay. what comes out of, of those discoveries. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, thank you. If I could just carry on from a theme that you just touched on there and noting that there's some young people in the audience here today. One of the wonderful things about paleontology is that anybody can go out there and actually be at the forefront of the science just by finding the right specimen. You know, you, you can't be an armchair uh, uh, lay person who's interested in, uh, in nuclear physics and go out and discover a new subatomic particle. It just doesn't happen. But in paleontology, you can be a weekend fossil collector. You can go out. You can find that specimen that is a new species that makes us completely rethink the way that uh, evolution's occurred in a particular branch of the family tree, and you will actually be at the forefront of that science. And I think that that gateway into the sciences, it's so important that the young people are here today. Maybe this weekend you might go out, you might find that fossil that'll turn it all around, put you right in the middle of the whole paleontology thing. Would you like to do that? Yeah. That'd be fun? Yeah. Um, thank you for the interesting talk, first of all. Um, I'm Alyssa Appleford and I'm in Year 6 at Warford. Um, for any of us who want to become paleontologists when we're older in the audience, what advice would you give us? Oh well, I suppose we could all answer this one, but you've just got to maintain that passion and interest and, and read up about fossils and paleontology, go to museums. I used to go to the museum in Melbourne when I was a kid growing up and take my fossils in and the curators would help identify them and I'm sure they, they still help do that at the South Australian Museum. Um, you've got to do well in sciences um, but also be widely read. Um, it helps to be able to write well. I did an, a unit in fine arts as well as science so I, I like to balance that, that ability to write well as well as being a, just a scientist. So yeah but just do well at school and get into a, a paleontology degree. This university here is probably one of the best in Australia right now for um, vertebrate paleontology if you want to study um, backboned animals. It's a little bit into the future, but last night I was Googling and I saw a new origin of life that be a frog cross an algorithm equals a xenophyte. That is the first signs of nanotechnology, an organism that is alive, that's created from mathematical equation. Mm. What are the ethics behind this? Because I think that's codswallop that we should be messing with my God and my Lord, Charles Darwin. Mm, interesting Comment? question. Um, I don't know much about that because it's a long way removed from fossil fish. But if it's a computer program, it would probably be a pseudo-living organism. It couldn't be a real living organism. So it's probably just something here. They're testing the, like the computer programs that were developed in the States that will run and then they'll evolve into different um, codes of computer. So it's just seeing how the natural process of things can randomly evolve. But I don't think it, it threatens the, the balance of life on the planet. Uh, hi, I'm Dan Monso. I'm a member of the Marine Life Society of South Australia and oh, yeah. I spend more time with living uh, organisms than I do with dead ones, but uh, I found your talk fascinating. Um, one of the things, uh, to link into Paul's uh, story before about the romance of, of discovery and how attractive this proposition is to young people here, natural history presents much the same thrill and uh, just to give you a very brief example, I was involved with a citizen science project last year where we made a minor contribution to science, there's several actually, but one was the range extension of uh, an eel that's native to Australia, but it uh, was believed to exist no, no, no further west than the Murray Mouth. And it turns out there's a population that's living at least part of its life in the Port River. Um, th uh, that made me curious, of course, about this fish's life history and its, uh, to a lesser extent, its physiology. Uh, and the fish 
lives in fresh water for most of its life, but then traverses land in some cases, enters the marine environment uh, in order to find partners and spawn. Um, that obviously, that, that fish obviously has some of those uh, air breathing <laughs> qualities that, that you uh, mentioned mm. in your talk. How close are our current living um, air breathing fishes to the fossil uh, specimens that you've studied in your work? I think I'll hand this one over to Alice because she's an expert in lung fishes. Oh, great. <laughs> um, yeah, well, I can give my two cents about lungfish. So lungfish are a fascinating group. Um, and it's often said that their fossil relatives are not that different to the lungfish that live today. And in a sense, I think they're not. But we do need to remember that they're separated by almost 400 million years of evolution. And so we may not be able to recognise exactly um, all the paths they've taken and all the things that have changed in that history of that lineage. Um, but what we can do is, and a big thing of what we do in paleontology is to look at the living fish around us today to better understand the history and the fossils and the geological record. I'm not sure if that answered your question. Mm. I mean, I could also add that like even lampreys that are jawless fishes can traverse paddocks to find water. And so you don't need to have necessarily lungs to breathe to be able to do that. You just need to be able to get in, be getting enough oxygen from a watery environment that, you, that you're crossing. Any other questions? One there, yeah. Well, I'll, I'll take a couple more questions after, after this one. If, sorry, if, if I may, uh, following up on that, mm. is there a chance or do you have any evidence, uh, and this happens with other pots, that they might be able to capture water in the gill area while they're traversing land in order yeah. to get oxygen through their gills? Yeah, well, is that something that well, happens with fish? Uh, yeah, um, mud skippers do that. They'll hold a bubble of water in their mouth. Um, yeah, fish have various ways of holding oxygen or taking accessory oxygen from the air as well. Like about 20% of fishes have accessory air breathing organs, like tarpons and things that you think are totally marine. They can still get a, a percentage of their oxygen from the air. So, and through the skin, the same way amphibians can respire oxygen through the skin. So yeah, I, well, it doesn't surprise me that, you know, fish can survive um, out of water for quite a long time if it's a moist environment. Um, John and Alice, I was wondering, do you see any differentiation in the vertebrae of your bony fishes, your early bony fishes, that's similar to the differentiation you get from the limbs in vertebrates? Uh, well, I'll start first. Um, yes, we do. Um, in our fish, our pistostegi, which we've got a series of papers to work on and, and, and to release, we do have a good regionalization of the vertebral column. Um, and, you know, in the advanced stem, in, in primitive bony fish, you get very simple regionalization, but you don't get clear distinctions between lumbar or thoracic or, you know, caudal vertebrae like you do in mammals. But you get slightly more robust vertebrae around the limbs and girdles and especially around the neck. You get an atlas occipital complex in some of these stem tetrapod fish. So they're starting to develop that ability to move the head around and have powerful neck muscles. And with that becomes, re becomes regionalization of the vertebral column. Uh, what subjects would you do in high school to help get a degree in paleontology? Um, well, science subjects, but especially biology. If you can do geology at high school, it's always great. I, didn't, I wasn't able to do either geology or biology at high school when I went through, so I just did maths, physics and chemistry. But any science subjects. And I, I think today, more and more, mathematics is becoming, you have to have an applied filter of statistics to almost anything you do. Just finding a single specimen and saying this happens is no longer good enough unless it's a, you know, a nature paper with a single specimen. Otherwise, you need to filter everything through statistics to see to what extent what you're actually proposing stands is, is significant. Uh, so mathematics is also a, a good one to take. Um. I just wanted to say, would it be worth uh, talking about the James Moore Memorial Prize for the youngsters in the room? There are a few. Yes, that was the very last thing we were going to say. Oh, okay, sorry. Um, it was on our agenda, but I will say a few words now. Um, in you memory of your own Dorothy Dix's eye. <laughs> <laughs> in memory of our good friend James Moore, who was part of our paleontology group, who was tragically killed in a, a car accident a few years ago, um, we have been raising money for this memorial prize in paleontology. 
which allows regional students from around South Australia to come and join a, a field trip, be part of our paleontology group and give them a taste of what paleontology is like at Flinders. So um, we've raised quite a bit of money over the years and you know you can donate online through uh, the Flinders University uh, James Moore if you look it up um, and we greatly appreciate anyone that can help us out with this good cause. So with that plug uh, I'd like you to join me in thanking John, Alice, Diego and Paul for that very interesting discussion. <laughs> And thank you for some very good uh, questions as well. Uh, so um, I just need to do a bit of an advertisement for the next of these lectures. The next Brave uh, um, uh, public lecture will be held next month at, the, at our uh, CBD campus in Victoria Square. I'm delighted to announce that our recently appointed Professor of Creative Arts, Gary Stewart, will be presenting on the art of collaboration. Many of you will know Gary from his extensive work and highly successful career as artistic director of, Australia, of the Australian Dance Theatre over the last 20 years. It's an absolute coup to have him lead creative arts at the university and I'm excited to see the dynamism that he brings to the role. The lecture will provide an insight into the innovative things that he's achieved through collaboration in the arts and perhaps also a sneak peek at what he's planning and has in store for us here at Flinders. So please join us on Tuesday 7th of April for the next public lecture, The Art of Collaboration. Thank you again for coming and uh, good evening.